Chapter Ten of the Evil Shepherd by E. Phillips Oppenheim. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Francis met Shopland one morning about a week later, on his way from Clarges Street to his chambers in the Temple. The detective raised his hat and would have passed on, but Francis accosted him. "'Any progress, Mr. Shopland?' he inquired. The detective fingered his small, sandy mustache. He was an insignificant-looking little man, undersized, with thin frame and watery eyes. His mouth, however, was hard, and there were some tell-tale little lines at its corners. "'None whatever, I'm sorry to say, Mr. Ledsman,' he admitted. "'At present we are quite in the dark. "'You found the weapon, I hear.' Shopland nodded. It was just an ordinary service revolver, dating from the time of the war, exactly like a hundred thousand others. The inquiries we were able to make from it came to nothing. Where was it picked up? In the middle of the waste plot of ground next to Soto's. The murderer evidently threw it there the moment he had discharged it. He must have been wearing rubber-soled shoes, for not a soul heard him go. Francis nodded thoughtfully. I wonder, he said, after a slight pause, whether it ever occurred to you to interview Miss Daisy Hyslop, the young lady who was with Bidlake on the night of his murder. I called upon her the day afterwards, the detective answered. She had nothing to say? Nothing, whatever. Indirectly, of course, Francis continued, the poor girl was the cause of his death. If she had not insisted upon his going out for a taxicab, the man who was loitering about would probably have never got hold of him. The detective glanced up furtively at the speaker. He seemed to reflect for a moment. I gathered, he said, in conversation with the commissionaire, that Miss Hyslop was a little impatient that night. It seems, however, that she was anxious to get to a ball which was being given down in Kensington. There was a ball, was there? Francis asked. Without a doubt, the detective replied. It was given by a Miss Clara Bultiwell. She happened to remember urging Miss Hyslop to come on as early as possible. So that's that, Francis observed. Just so, Mr. Ledsman, the detective murmured. They were walking along the mall now, eastwards. The detective, who seemed to have been just a saunterer, had accommodated himself to Francis's destination. "'Let me see. There was nothing stolen from the young man's person, was there?' Francis asked presently. "'Apparently nothing at all, sir. And I gather that you have made every possible inquiry as to the young man's relations with his friends. So far as one can learn, sir, they seem to have been perfectly amicable.' "'Of course,' Francis remarked presently. This may have been quite a purposeless affair. The deed may have been committed by a man who was practically a lunatic, without any motive or reason whatever. Precisely so, sir, the detective agreed. But all the same, I don't think it was. Neither do I, sir. Francis smiled slightly. Shopland, he said, if there is no further external evidence to be collected, I suggest that there is only one person likely to prove of assistance to you. And that one person, sir? Miss Daisy Hyslop. The young lady whom I have already seen? Francis nodded. The young lady whom you have already seen, he assented. At the same time, Mr. Shoplin, we must remember this. If Miss Hyslop had any knowledge of the facts which are behind Mr. Bitlake's murder, it is more likely to be to her interest to keep them to herself than to give them away to the police free gratis and for nothing. Do you follow me? Precisely, sir. That being so, Francis continued, I am going to make a proposition to you for what it is worth. Where were you going when I met you this morning, Shoplin? To call upon you in Clergus Street, sir. What for? I was going to ask you if you would be so kind as to call upon Miss Daisy Hyslop, sir. Francis smiled. Great minds, he murmured. 
I will see the young lady this afternoon, Shoplin. The detective raised his hat. They had reached the spot where his companion turned off by the horse guard's parade. I may hope to hear from you then, sir? Within the course of a day or two, perhaps earlier, Francis promised. Francis continued his walk along the embankment to his chambers in the temple. He glanced in the outer office as he passed to his consulting room. "'Anything fresh, Angrave?' he asked his head clerk. "'Nothing whatever, sir,' was the quiet reply. He passed on to his own den, a bare room with long windows looking out over the gardens. He glanced at two or three letters which lay on his desk, none of them of the least interest, and leaning back in his chair, commenced to fill his pipe. There was a knock at the door. Fawcett, a young beginner at the bar, in whom he had taken some interest and who deviled for him, presented himself. "'Can I have a word with you, Mr. Letson?' he asked. "'By all means,' was the prompt response. "'Sit down.' Fawcett seated himself on the other side of the table. He had a long, thin face, dark, narrow eyes, unwholesome complexion, a slightly hooked nose, and teeth discolored through constant smoking. His fingers, too, bore the tell-tale yellow stains. "'Mr. Ledsman,' he said, "'I think, with your permission, I should like to leave at the end of my next three months.' Francis glanced across at him. "'Sorry to hear that, Fawcett. Are you going to work for anyone else?' "'I haven't made arrangements yet, sir,' the young man replied. "'I thought of offering myself to Mr. Barnes.' "'Why do you want to leave me?' Francis asked. "'There isn't enough for me to do, sir.' Francis lit his pipe. "'It is probably just a lull, Fawcett,' he remarked. "'I don't think so, sir.' "'The devil! You've been gossiping with some of these solicitors' clerks, Fawcett.' "'I shouldn't call it gossiping, sir. "'I'm always interested to hear anything that may concern our, my future. "'I have reason to believe, sir, that we are being passed over for briefs. "'The reason being? "'One can't pick and choose, sir. "'One shouldn't, anyway.' "'Francis smiled. "'You evidently don't approve of any measure of personal choice "'as to the work one takes up. "'Certainly I do not, sir. It is our profession. "'The only brief I would refuse would be a losing one or an ill-paid one. "'I don't conceive it to be our business to prejudge a case.' "'I see,' Francis murmured. "'Go on, Fawcett.' "'There's a rumor about,' the young man continued, "'that you are only going to plead where the chances are that your client is innocent.' "'There's some truth in that,' Francis admitted. "'If I could leave a little before the three months, sir, I should be glad,' Fawcett said. "'I look at the matter from an entirely different point of view.' "'You shall leave when you like, of course, Fawcett. But tell me what that point of view is.' "'Just this, sir. The simplest-minded idiot who ever stammered through his address can get an innocent prisoner off if he knows enough of the facts and the law. To my mind... The real triumph in our profession is to be able to unwind the meshes of damning facts and force a verdict for an indubitably guilty client. "'How does the moral side of that appeal to you?' his senior inquired. "'I didn't become a barrister to study morals, or even to consider them,' was the somewhat caustic reply. "'When one brief is in my mind, it is a matter of brain, cunning, and resource. The guiltier the man, the greater success if you can get him off. And turn him loose again upon society? It isn't our job to consider that, sir. The moral question is only confusing in the matter. Our job is to make use of the law for the benefit of our client. That is what we're paid for. That's the measure of our success or failure. Francis nodded. Very reasonably put, Fawcett, he conceded. I'll give you a letter to Barnes whenever you like. I should be glad if you would do so, sir, the young man said. I'm only wasting my time here. Francis wrote a letter of recommendation to Barnes, the great K.C., 
considered a stray brief which had found its way in and strolled up towards the milum as the hour approached the luncheon time in the american bar of that palatial hotel he found the young man he was looking for a flaxen-haired youth who was seated upon one of the small tables with his feet upon a chair laying down the law to a little group of acquaintances he greeted francis cordially but without the due measure of respect which nineteen should accord to thirty-five cheerio my elder relative he exclaimed have a cocktail francis nodded assent come into this corner with me for a moment charles he invited i have a word for your ear the young man rose and sat by his uncle's side on a settee in my declining years the latter began i find myself reverting to the follies of youth i require a letter of introduction from you to a young lady of your acquaintance the devil not one of my own special little pets i hope her name is miss daisy hyslop francis announced lord charles southover pursed his lips and whistled he glanced at francis sideways is this the beginning of a campaign amongst the butterflies he inquired because if so i feel it my duty uncle to address to you a few words of solemn warning miss daisy hyslop is hot stuff look here young fellow francis said equably i don't know what the state of your exchequer is i owe you forty lord charles interrupted spring another tenor make it fifty that is and the letter of introduction i will write for you will bring tears of gratitude to your eyes i'll spring the tenor francis promised but you will write just what i tell you no more and no less anything extra for keeping me mum at home the young man ventured tentatively you're a nice sort of nephew to have francis declared abandon these futile attempts at blackmail and just come this way to the writing table you've got the tenor with you the young man asked anxiously francis produced a well-filled pocket-book his nephew led the way to a writing table lit a cigarette which he stuck into the corner of his mouth and in painstaking fashion wrote the few lines which francis dictated the ten pounds changed hands have one with me for luck the young man invited brightly no perhaps you're right he added in a valedictory fashion you'd better keep your head clear for daisy end of chapter ten chapter ten of the evil shepherd by e phillips oppenheim this librivox recording is in the public domain francis met shopland one morning about a week later on his way from clergis street to his chambers in the temple the detective raised his hat and would have passed on but francis accosted him any progress mr shopland he inquired the detective fingered his small sandy moustache he was an insignificant-looking little man undersized with thin frame and watery eyes his mouth however was hard and there were some tell-tale little lines at its corners none whatever i'm sorry to say mr ledsman he admitted at present we are quite in the dark you found the weapon i hear shopland nodded it was just an ordinary service revolver dating from the time of the war exactly like a hundred thousand others the inquiries we were able to make from it came to nothing where was it picked up in the middle of the waste plot of ground next to soto's the murderer evidently threw it there the moment he had discharged it he must have been wearing rubber-soled shoes for not a soul heard him go francis nodded thoughtfully I wonder, he said, after a slight pause, whether it ever occurred to you to interview Miss Daisy Hyslop, the young lady who was with Bidlake on the night of his murder. I called upon her the day afterwards, the detective answered. She had nothing to say? Nothing, whatever. Indirectly, of course, Francis continued, the poor girl was the cause of his death. 
if she had not insisted upon his going out for a taxicab, the man who was loitering about would probably have never got hold of him. The detective glanced up furtively at the speaker. He seemed to reflect for a moment. I gathered, he said, in conversation with the commissionaire, that Miss Hyslop was a little impatient that night. It seems, however, that she was anxious to get to a ball which was being given down in Kensington. There was a ball, was there? Francis asked. Without a doubt, the detective replied, it was given by a Miss Clara Bultiwell. She happened to remember urging Miss Hyslop to come on as early as possible. So that's that, Francis observed. Just so, Mr. Ledsman, the detective murmured. They were walking along the mall now, eastwards. The detective, who seemed to have been just a saunterer, had accommodated himself to Francis's destination. Let me see, there was nothing stolen from the young man's person, was there? Francis asked presently. Apparently nothing at all, sir. And I gather that you have made every possible inquiry as to the young man's relations with his friends. So far as one can learn, sir, they seem to have been perfectly amicable. Of course, Francis remarked presently, this may have been quite a purposeless affair. The deed may have been committed by a man who was practically a lunatic, without any motive or reason whatever. Precisely so, sir, the detective agreed. But all the same, I don't think it was. Neither do I, sir. Francis smiled slightly. Shoplin, he said, if there is no further external evidence to be collected, I suggest that there is only one person likely to prove of assistance to you. And that one person, sir? Miss Daisy Hyslop. The young lady whom I have already seen? Francis nodded. The young lady whom you have already seen, he assented. At the same time, Mr. Shoplin, we must remember this. If Miss Hyslop had any knowledge of the facts which are behind Mr. Bitlake's murder, it is more likely to be to her interest to keep them to herself than to give them away to the police free gratis and for nothing. Do you follow me? Precisely, sir. That being so, Francis continued, I am going to make a proposition to you for what it is worth. Where were you going when I met you this morning, Shoplin? To call upon you in Clergus Street, sir. What for? I was going to ask you if you would be so kind as to call upon Miss Daisy Hyslop, sir. Francis smiled. Great minds, he murmured. I will see the young lady this afternoon, Shoplin. The detective raised his hat. They had reached the spot where his companion turned off by the horse guards' parade. I may hope to hear from you then, sir? Within the course of a day or two, perhaps earlier, Francis promised. Francis continued his walk along the embankment to his chambers in the temple. He glanced in the outer office as he passed to his consulting room. Anything fresh and grave, he asked his head clerk. Nothing whatever, sir, was the quiet reply. He passed on to his own den, a bare room with long windows looking out over the gardens. He glanced at two or three letters which lay on his desk, none of them of the least interest, and leaning back in his chair, commenced to fill his pipe. There was a knock at the door. Fawcett, a young beginner at the bar, in whom he had taken some interest and who deviled for him, presented himself. "'Can I have a word with you, Mr. Letson? he asked. "'By all means,' was the prompt response. "'Sit down.' Fawcett seated himself on the other side of the table. He had a long, thin face, dark, narrow eyes, unwholesome complexion, a slightly hooked nose, and teeth discolored through constant smoking. His fingers, too, bore the tell-tale yellow stains. Mr. Ledsman, he said, I think, with your permission, I should like to leave at the end of my next three months. Francis glanced across at him. Sorry to hear that, Fawcett. Are you going to work for anyone else? I haven't made arrangements yet, sir, the young man replied. I thought of offering myself to Mr. Barnes. 
"'Why do you want to leave me?' Francis asked. "'There isn't enough for me to do, sir.' Francis lit his pipe. "'It is probably just a lull, Fawcett,' he remarked. "'I don't think so, sir.' "'The devil! You've been gossiping with some of these solicitors' clerks, Fawcett.' "'I shouldn't call it gossiping, sir. I'm always interested to hear anything that may concern our, my future. I have reason to believe, sir, that we are being passed over for briefs. The reason being? One can't pick and choose, sir. One shouldn't, anyway. Francis smiled. You evidently don't approve of any measure of personal choice as to the work one takes up. Certainly I do not, sir. It is our profession. The only brief I would refuse would be a losing one or an ill-paid one. I don't conceive it to be our business to prejudge a case. I see, Francis murmured. Go on, Fawcett. There's a rumor about, the young man continued, that you are only going to plead where the chances are that your client is innocent. There's some truth in that, Francis admitted. If I could leave a little before the three months, sir, I should be glad, Fawcett said. I look at the matter from an entirely different point of view. You shall leave when you like, of course, Fawcett. But tell me what that point of view is. Just this, sir. The simplest-minded idiot who ever stammered through his address can get an innocent prisoner off if he knows enough of the facts and the law. To my mind, the real triumph in our profession is to be able to unwind the meshes of damning facts and force a verdict for an indubitably guilty client. How does the moral side of that appeal to you? his senior inquired. I didn't become a barrister to study morals, or even to consider them, was the somewhat caustic reply. When one brief is in my mind, it is a matter of brain, cunning, and resource. The guiltier the man, the greater success if you can get him off. And turn him loose again upon society? It isn't our job to consider that, sir. The moral question is only confusing in the matter. Our job is to make use of the law for the benefit of our client. That is what we're paid for. That's the measure of our success or failure. Francis nodded. Very reasonably put, Fawcett, he conceded. I'll give you a letter to Barnes whenever you like. I should be glad if you would do so, sir, the young man said. I'm only wasting my time here. Francis wrote a letter of recommendation to Barnes, the great K.C., considered a stray brief, which had found its way in, and strolled up towards the Milam as the hour approached the luncheon time. In the American bar of that palatial hotel, he found the young man he was looking for, a flaxen-haired youth who was seated upon one of the small tables, with his feet upon a chair, laying down the law to a little group of acquaintances. He greeted Francis cordially, but without the due measure of respect which nineteen should accord to thirty-five. "'Cheerio, my elder relative,' he exclaimed. "'Have a cocktail.' Francis nodded assent. "'Come into this corner with me for a moment, Charles,' he invited. "'I have a word for your ear.' The young man rose and sat by his uncle's side on a settee. In my declining years, the latter began, I find myself reverting to the follies of youth. I require a letter of introduction from you to a young lady of your acquaintance. The devil! Not one of my own special little pets, I hope. Her name is Miss Daisy Hyslop, Francis announced. Lord Charles Southover pursed his lips and whistled. He glanced at Francis sideways. Is this the beginning of a campaign amongst the butterflies? he inquired. Because if so, I feel it my duty, uncle, to address to you a few words of solemn warning. Miss Daisy Hyslop is hot stuff. Look here, young fellow, Francis said equably. I don't know what the state of your exchequer is. I owe you forty, Lord Charles interrupted. Spring another tenor, make it fifty, that is and the letter of introduction I will write for you will bring tears of gratitude to your eyes. 
I'll spring the tenor, Francis promised, but you will write just what I tell you, no more and no less. Anything extra for keeping me mum at home, the young man ventured tentatively. You're a nice sort of nephew to have, Francis declared. Abandon these futile attempts at blackmail and just come this way to the writing table. You've got the tenor with you, the young man asked anxiously. Francis produced a well-filled pocketbook. His nephew led the way to a writing table, lit a cigarette, which he stuck into the corner of his mouth, and in painstaking fashion wrote the few lines which Francis dictated. The ten pounds changed hands. "'Have one with me for luck,' the young man invited brightly. "'No? Perhaps you're right,' he added, in a valedictory fashion. You'd better keep your head clear for Daisy. End of chapter 10「Chapter 11 of the Evil Shepherd by E. Phillips Oppenheim. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Miss Daisy Hyslop received Francis that afternoon in the sitting room of her little suite at the Milam. Her welcoming smile was plaintive and a little subdued, her manner undeniably gracious. She was dressed in black, a wonderful background for her really gorgeous hair, and her deportment indicated a recent loss. "'How nice of you to come and see me,' she murmured, with a lingering touch of the fingers. "'Do take that easy chair, please, and sit down and talk to me. Your roses were beautiful.' But whatever made you send them to me? Impulse, he answered. She laughed softly. Then please yield to such impulses as often as you feel them, she begged. I adore flowers. Just now, too, she added, with a little sigh. Anything is welcome which helps to keep my mind off my own affairs. It was very good of you to let me come, he declared. I can quite understand that you don't feel like seeing many people just now. Francis's manner, although deferential and courteous, had nevertheless some quality of aloofness in it to which she was unused, and which she was quick to recognize. The smile faded from her face. She seemed suddenly not quite so young. "'Haven't I seen you before somewhere quite lately?' she asked, a little sharply. You saw me at Soto's, the night that Victor Bidlake was murdered, he reminded her. I stood quite close to you both while you were waiting for your taxi. The animation evoked by this call from a presumably new admirer suddenly left her. She became nervous and constrained. She glanced again at his card. Don't tell me, she begged, that you have come to ask me any questions about that night. I simply could not bear it. The police have been here twice, and I had nothing to tell them, absolutely nothing. Quite right, he assented soothingly. Police have such a clumsy way of expecting valuable information for nothing. I'm always glad to hear of their being disappointed. She studied her visitor for a moment carefully. Then she turned to the table by her side, picked up a note, and read it through. Lord Southover tells me here, she said, that you are just a pal of his who wants to make my acquaintance. He doesn't say why. Is that necessary? Francis asked good-naturedly. She moved in her chair a little nervously, crossing and uncrossing her legs more than once. Her white silk stockings underneath her black skirt were exceedingly effective, a fact of which she never lost consciousness although at that moment she was scarcely inspired to play the coquette. I'd like to think it wasn't, she admitted frankly. I've seen you repeatedly upon the stage, he told her, and though musical comedy is rather out of my line, I have always admired you immensely. She studied him once more, almost wistfully. You look very nice, she acknowledged, but you don't look at all like the kind of man who admires girls who do that sort of rubbish I do on the stage. 
"'What do I look like?' he asked, smiling. "'A man with a purpose,' she answered. "'I begin to think,' he ventured, "'that we shall get on. "'You are really a very astute young lady. "'You are quite sure you are not one of these amateur detectives one reads about?' she demanded. "'Certainly not,' he assured her. "'I will confess that I am interested in Victor Bidlock's death, "'and I should like to discover the truth about it. "'But I have a reason for that which I may tell you some day. "'It has nothing whatever to do with the young man himself. "'To the best of my belief, I never saw or heard of him before in my life. "'My interest lies with another person. "'You have lost a great friend, I know.' If you feel disposed to tell me the whole story, it might make such a difference. She sighed. Her confidence was returning, also her self-pity. The latter at once betrayed itself. You see, she confided, Victor and I were engaged to be married, so naturally I let him help me a little. I shan't be able to stay on here now. They are bothering me about their bill already, she added with a side glance at an envelope which stood on a table by her side. He drew a little nearer to her. Miss Hyslop, he began. Daisy, she interrupted. Miss Daisy Hyslop, then, he continued, smiling. I suggested, just now, that I did not want to come and bother you for information without any return. If I can be of any assistance to you in that matter, he added, glancing towards the envelope, I shall be very pleased. She sighed gratefully. Just till Victor's people return to town, she said, I know that they mean to do something for me. How much, she asked. Two hundred pounds would keep me going, she told him. He wrote out a check. Miss Hyslop drew a sigh of relief as she laid it on one side with the envelope. Then she swung round in her chair to face him, where he sat at the writing table. I'm afraid you will think that what I have to tell is very insignificant, she confessed. Victor was one of those boys who always fancied themselves bored. He was bored with polo, bored with motoring, bored with the country, and bored with town. Then quite suddenly, during the last few weeks, he seemed changed. All that he would tell me was that he had found a new interest in life. I don't know what it was, but I don't think it was a nice one. He seemed to drop all his old friends, too, and go about with a new set altogether. Not a nice set at all. He used to stay out all night, and he quite gave up going to dances and places where he could take me. Once or twice he came here in the afternoon, deadbeat, without having been to bed at all and before he could say half a dozen words he was asleep in my easy chair. He used to mutter such horrible things that I had to wake him up. "'Was he ever short of money?' Francis asked. She shook her head. "'Not seriously,' she answered. "'He was quite well off, besides what his people allowed him. I was going to have a wonderful settlement as soon as our engagement was announced. However, to go on with what I was telling you, the very night before it happened, he came in to see me, looking like nothing on earth. He cried like a baby, behaved like a lunatic, and called himself all manner of names. He had had a great deal too much to drink, and I gathered that he had seen something horrible. It was then he asked me to dine with him the next night, and told me that he was going to break altogether with his new friends. Something in connection with them seemed to have given him a terrible fright. Francis nodded. He had the tact to abandon his curiosity at this precise point. The old story, he declared, bad company and rotten habits. I suppose someone got to know that the young man usually carried a great deal of money about with him. It was so foolish of him, she assented eagerly. I warned him about it so often. The police wouldn't listen to it, but I am absolutely certain that he was robbed. I noticed when he paid the bill that he had a great wad of banknotes which were never discovered afterwards. Francis rose to his feet. What are you doing tonight? he inquired. 
Nothing, she acknowledged eagerly. Then let's dine somewhere and see the show at the frivolty, he suggested. You dear man, she assented with enthusiasm, the one thing I wanted to do, and the one person I wanted to do it with. End of chapter 11「Chapter Eleven of the Evil Shepherd by E. Phillips Oppenheim. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Miss Daisy Hyslop received Francis that afternoon in the sitting room of her little suite at the Milam. Her welcoming smile was plaintive and a little subdued, her manner undeniably gracious. She was dressed in black, a wonderful background for her really gorgeous hair, and her deportment indicated a recent loss. "'How nice of you to come and see me,' she murmured, with a lingering touch of the fingers. "'Do take that easy chair, please, and sit down and talk to me. Your roses were beautiful, but whatever made you send them to me?' "'Impulse,' he answered. She laughed softly. "'Then please yield to such impulses as often as you feel them, she begged. I adore flowers. Just now, too, she added, with a little sigh. Anything is welcome, which helps to keep my mind off my own affairs. It was very good of you to let me come, he declared. I can quite understand that you don't feel like seeing many people just now. Francis's manner, although deferential and courteous, had nevertheless some quality of aloofness in it to which she was unused and which she was quick to recognize the smile faded from her face she seemed suddenly not quite so young haven't i seen you before somewhere quite lately she asked a little sharply you saw me at soto's the night that victor bidlake was murdered he reminded her i stood quite close to you both while you were waiting for your taxi the animation evoked by this call from a presumably new admirer suddenly left her. She became nervous and constrained. She glanced again at his card. Don't tell me, she begged, that you have come to ask me any questions about that night. I simply could not bear it. The police have been here twice, and I had nothing to tell them, absolutely nothing. Quite right, he assented soothingly. Police have such a clumsy way of expecting valuable information for nothing. I'm always glad to hear of their being disappointed. She studied her visitor for a moment carefully. Then she turned to the table by her side, picked up a note, and read it through. Lord Southover tells me here, she said, that you are just a pal of his who wants to make my acquaintance. He doesn't say why. Is that necessary? Francis asked good-naturedly. She moved in her chair a little nervously, crossing and uncrossing her legs more than once. Her white silk stockings underneath her black skirt were exceedingly effective, a fact of which she never lost consciousness, although at that moment she was scarcely inspired to play the coquette. I'd like to think it wasn't, she admitted frankly. I've seen you repeatedly upon the stage, he told her, and though musical comedy is rather out of my line, I have always admired you immensely. She studied him once more, almost wistfully. You look very nice, she acknowledged, but you don't look at all like the kind of man who admires girls who do that sort of rubbish I do on the stage. What do I look like, he asked, smiling. A man with a purpose, she answered. I begin to think, he ventured, that we shall get on. You are really a very astute young lady. You are quite sure you are not one of these amateur detectives one reads about, she demanded. Certainly not, he assured her. I will confess that I am interested in Victor Bidlock's death, and I should like to discover the truth about it. But I have a reason for that which I may tell you some day. It has nothing whatever to do with the young man himself. To the best of my belief, 
I never saw or heard of him before in my life. My interest lies with another person. You have lost a great friend, I know. If you feel disposed to tell me the whole story, it might make such a difference. She sighed. Her confidence was returning, also her self-pity. The latter at once betrayed itself. You see, she confided, Victor and I were engaged to be married, so naturally I let him help me a little. I shan't be able to stay on here now. They are bothering me about their bill already, she added, with a side glance at an envelope which stood on a table by her side. He drew a little nearer to her. Miss Highslop, he began. Daisy, she interrupted. Miss Daisy Highslop, then, he continued, smiling. I suggested, just now, that I did not want to come and bother you for information without any return. If I can be of any assistance to you in that matter, he added, glancing towards the envelope, I shall be very pleased. She sighed gratefully. Just till Victor's people return to town, she said, I know that they mean to do something for me. How much, she asked. Two hundred pounds would keep me going, she told him. He wrote out a check. Miss Hyslop drew a sigh of relief as she laid it on one side with the envelope. Then she swung round in her chair to face him, where he sat at the writing table. I'm afraid you will think that what I have to tell is very insignificant, she confessed. Victor was one of those boys who always fancied themselves bored. He was bored with polo, bored with motoring, bored with the country, and bored with town. Then quite suddenly, during the last few weeks, he seemed changed. All that he would tell me was that he had found a new interest in life. I don't know what it was, but I don't think it was a nice one. He seemed to drop all his old friends, too, and go about with a new set altogether. Not a nice set at all. He used to stay out all night, and he quite gave up going to dances and places where he could take me. Once or twice he came here in the afternoon, deadbeat, without having been to bed at all, and before he could say half a dozen words he was asleep in my easy chair. He used to mutter such horrible things that I had to wake him up. Was he ever short of money? Francis asked. She shook her head. Not seriously, she answered. He was quite well off, besides what his people allowed him. I was going to have a wonderful settlement as soon as our engagement was announced. However, to go on with what I was telling you, the very night before it happened, he came in to see me, looking like nothing on earth. He cried like a baby, behaved like a lunatic, and called himself all manner of names. He had had a great deal too much to drink, and I gathered that he had seen something horrible. It was then he asked me to dine with him the next night and told me that he was going to break altogether with his new friends. Something in connection with them seemed to have given him a terrible fright. Francis nodded. He had the tact to abandon his curiosity at this precise point. The old story, he declared, bad company and rotten habits. I suppose someone got to know that the young man usually carried a great deal of money about with him. It was so foolish of him, she assented eagerly. I warned him about it so often. The police wouldn't listen to it, but I am absolutely certain that he was robbed. I noticed when he paid the bill that he had a great wad of banknotes which were never discovered afterwards. Francis rose to his feet. What are you doing tonight? he inquired. Nothing, she acknowledged eagerly. Then let's dine somewhere and see the show at the frivolty, he suggested. You dear man, she assented with enthusiasm, the one thing I wanted to do, and the one person I wanted to do it with. End of chapter 11「Chapter 12 of the Evil Shepherd by E. Phillips Oppenheim this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It was after leaving Miss Daisy Hyslop's flat 
that the event to which Francis Ledsman had been looking forward to more than anything else in the world happened. It came about entirely by chance. There were no taxis in the Strand. Francis himself had finished work for the day, and feeling disinclined for his usual rubber of bridge, he strolled homeward along the mall. At the corner of Green Park, he came face to face with a woman who, for the last few months, had scarcely been out of his thoughts. Even in that first moment he realized to his pain that she would have avoided him if she could. They met, however, where the path narrowed and he left her no chance to avoid him. That curious impulse of conventionality, which opens a conversation always with cut and dried banalities, saved them, perhaps, from a certain amount of embarrassment. Without any conscious suggestion, they found themselves walking side by side. "'I have been wanting to see you very much indeed,' he said. "'I even went so far as to wonder whether I dared call.' "'Why should you?' she asked. Our acquaintance began and ended in tragedy. There is scarcely any purpose in carrying it further. He looked at her for a moment before replying. She was wearing black, but scarcely the black of a woman who sorrows. She was still frigidly beautiful, redolent in all details of her toilet, of that almost negative perfection which she had learnt to expect from her. She suggested to him still that same sense of aloofness from the actualities of life. "'I prefer not to believe that it is ended,' he protested. "'Have you so many friends that you have no room for one who has never consciously done you any harm?' She looked at him with some faint curiosity in her immobile features. "'Harm? No. On the contrary, I suppose, I ought to thank you for your evidence at the inquest. Some part of it was the truth, he replied. I suppose so, she admitted dryly. You told it very cleverly. He looked her in the eyes. My profession helped me to be a good witness, he said. As for the gist of my evidence, that was between my conscience and myself. Your conscience, she repeated. Are there really men who possess such things? I hope you will discover that for yourself some day, he answered. Tell me your plans. Where are you living? For the present, with my father in Curzon Street. With Sir Timothy Brast? She assented. You know him? She asked indifferently. Very slightly, Francis replied. We talked together some nights ago at Soto's restaurant. I'm afraid I did not make a very favorable impression upon him. I gathered, too, that he has somewhat eccentric tastes. I do not see a great deal of my father, she said. We met a few months ago, for the first time since my marriage, and things have been a little difficult between us, just at first. He really scarcely ever puts in an appearance at Curzon Street. I dare say you have heard that he makes a hobby of an amazing country house which he has down the river. The walled house, he ventured. She nodded. I see you have heard of it. All London, they tell me, gossips about the entertainments there. Are they really so wonderful, he asked. I've never been the one, she replied. As a matter of fact, I've spent scarcely any time in England since my marriage. My husband, as I remember he told you, was fond of traveling. Notwithstanding the warm spring air, he was conscious of a certain chilliness. Her level, indifferent tones seemed to him almost abnormally callous. A horrible realization flashed for a moment in his brain. She was speaking of the man whom she had killed. Your father overheard a remark of mine, Francis told her. I was at Soto's with a friend, Andrew Wilmore, the novelist. And to tell you the truth, we were speaking of the shock I experienced when I realized that I had been devoting every effort of which I was capable to saving the life of, shall we say, a criminal. Your father heard me say, in rather flamboyant manner, perhaps that in future I declare war against all crime and all criminals. 
She smiled very faintly, a smile which had in it no single element of joy or humor. "'I can quite understand my father intervening,' she said. "'He poses as being a rather patron of artistically perpetrated crime. Sue is his favorite author, and I believe that he has exceedingly grim ideas as to dueling and fighting generally. He was in prison once for six months at New Orleans for killing a man who insulted my mother. Nothing in the world will ever have convinced him that he had not done a perfectly legitimate thing. I am expecting to find him quite an interesting study when I know him better, Francis pronounced. My only fear is that he will count me an unfriendly person and refuse to have anything to do with me. I am not at all sure, she said indifferently, that it would not be very much better for you if he did. I cannot admit that, he answered, smiling. I think that our paths in life are too far apart for either of us to influence the other. You don't share his tastes, do you? Which ones? she asked, after a moment's silence. Well, boxing for one, he replied. They tell me that he is the greatest living patron of the ring, both here and in America. I have never been to a fight in my life, she confessed. I hope that I never may. I can't go as far as that, he declared. But boxing isn't altogether one of my hobbies. Can't we leave your father and his tastes alone for the present? I would rather talk about ourselves. Tell me what you care about most in life. Nothing, she answered listlessly. But that is only a phase, he persisted. You have had terrible trials, I know, and they must have affected your outlook on life. But you are still young, and while one is young, life is always worth having. I thought so once, she assented. I don't now. But there must be. There will be compensations, he assured her. I know that just now you are suffering from the reaction. After all, you have gone through. The memory of that will pass. The memory of what I have gone through will never pass, she answered. There was a moment's intense silence, a silence pregnant with reminiscent drama. The little room rose up before his memory, the woman's hopeless, hating eyes the quivering thread of steel, the dead man's mocking words. He seemed at that moment to see into the recesses of her mind. Was it remorse that troubled her, he wondered? Did she lack strength to realize that in that half-hour at the inquest he had placed on record forever his judgment of her deed? Even to think of it now was morbid, although he would never have confessed it even to himself. There was growing daily in his mind some idea of reward. She had never thanked him. He hoped that she never would. But he had surely a right to claim some measure of her thoughts, some light place in her life. Please look at me, he begged, a little abruptly. She turned her head in some surprise. Francis was almost handsome in the clear spring sunlight, his face alight with animation his deep-set gray eyes, full of amused yet anxious solicitude. Even as she appreciated these things, and became dimly conscious of his eager interest, her perturbation seemed to grow. Well, she ventured, do I look like a person who knew what he was talking about? he asked. On the whole, I should say that you did, she admitted. Very well, then, he went on cheerfully, believe me when I say, that the shadow which depresses you all the time now will pass. I say this confidently, he added, his voice softening, because I hope to be allowed to help. Haven't you guessed that I am very glad indeed to see you again? She came to a sudden standstill. They had just passed through Lansdowne Passage and were in the quiet end of Curzon Street. But you must not talk to me like that, she expostulated. Why not, he demanded. We have met under strange and untoward circumstances. But are you so different from other women? For a single moment she seemed infinitely more human, startled, a little nervous, 
exquisitely sympathetic to an amazing and unexpected impression. She seemed to look with glad but terrified eyes toward the vision of possible things, and then to realize that it was but a trick of the fancy and to come shivering back to the world of actualities. I am very different, she said quietly. I have lived my life. What I lack in years has been made up to me in horror. I have no desire now but to get rid of this aftermath of years as smoothly and quickly as possible. I do not wish any man, Mr. Letzman, to talk to me as you are doing. You will not accept my friendship? It is impossible, she replied. May I be allowed to call upon you? he went on doggedly. I do not receive visitors, she answered. They were walking slowly up Corzon Street now. She had given him every opportunity to leave her, opportunities to which he was persistently blind. Her obstinacy had been a shock to him. I am sorry, he said, but I cannot accept my dismissal like this. I shall appeal to your father. However much he may dislike me, he has at least common sense. She looked at him with a touch of the old horror in her coldly questioning eyes. In your way, you have been kind to me, she admitted. Let me in return give you a word of advice. Let me beg you to have nothing whatever to do with my father, in friendship or in enmity. Either might be equally disastrous. Either in the long run is likely to cost you dear. If that is your opinion of your father, why do you live with him? he asked. She had become entirely callous again. Her smile, with its mocking quality, reminded him for a moment of the man whom they were discussing. Because I am a luxury and comfort loving parasite, she answered deliberately. Because my father gladly pays my accounts at Lucille and Worth and Reveille. Because I have never learnt to do without things. And please remember this, my father, so far as I am concerned, has no faults. He is a generous and courteous companion. Nevertheless, number 7B, Curzon Street, is no place for people who desire to lead normal lives. And with that she was gone. Her gesture of dismissal was so complete and final that he had no courage for further argument. He had lost her almost as soon as he had found her. End of chapter 12「Chapter Twelve of the Evil Shepherd by E. Phillips Oppenheim. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It was after leaving Miss Daisy Highslop's flat that the event to which Francis Ledsman had been looking forward to more than anything else in the world happened. It came about entirely by chance. There were no taxis in the strand. Francis himself had finished work for the day and feeling disinclined for his usual rubber of bridge, he strolled homeward along the mall. At the corner of Green Park, he came face to face with a woman who, for the last few months, had scarcely been out of his thoughts. Even in that first moment, he realized to his pain that she would have avoided him if she could. They met, however, where the path narrowed, and he left her no chance to avoid him. That curious impulse of conventionality, which opens a conversation always with cut and dried banalities, saved them, perhaps, from a certain amount of embarrassment. Without any conscious suggestion, they found themselves walking side by side. "'I have been wanting to see you very much indeed,' he said. "'I even went so far as to wonder whether I dared call.' "'Why should you?' she asked. "'Our acquaintance began and ended in tragedy. There is scarcely any purpose in carrying it further. He looked at her for a moment before replying. She was wearing black, but scarcely the black of a woman who sorrows. She was still frigidly beautiful, redolent in all details of her toilet, of that almost negative perfection which she had learnt to expect from her, 
She suggested to him still that same sense of aloofness from the actualities of life. I prefer not to believe that it is ended, he protested. Have you so many friends that you have no room for one who has never consciously done you any harm? She looked at him with some faint curiosity in her immobile features. Harm? No. On the contrary, I suppose, I ought to thank you for your evidence at the inquest. Some part of it was the truth, he replied. I suppose so, she admitted dryly. You told it very cleverly. He looked her in the eyes. My profession helped me to be a good witness, he said. As for the gist of my evidence, that was between my conscience and myself. Your conscience, she repeated. Are there really men who possess such things? I hope you will discover that for yourself some day, he answered. Tell me your plans. Where are you living? For the present, with my father, in Curzon Street. With Sir Timothy Brast? She assented. You know him? She asked indifferently. Very slightly, Francis replied. We talked together some nights ago at Soto's restaurant. I'm afraid I did not make a very favorable impression upon him. I gathered, too, that he has somewhat eccentric tastes. I do not see a great deal of my father, she said. We met a few months ago, for the first time since my marriage, and things have been a little difficult between us, just at first. He really scarcely ever puts in an appearance at Curzon Street. I dare say you have heard that he makes a hobby of an amazing country house which he has down the river. The walled house, he ventured. She nodded. I see you have heard of it. All London, they tell me, gossips about the entertainments there. Are they really so wonderful, he asked. I've never been to one, she replied. As a matter of fact, I've spent scarcely any time in England since my marriage. My husband, as I remember he told you, was fond of traveling. Notwithstanding the warm spring air, he was conscious of a certain chilliness. Her level, indifferent tones seemed to him almost abnormally callous. A horrible realization flashed for a moment in his brain. She was speaking of the man whom she had killed. Your father overheard a remark of mine, Francis told her. I was at Soto's with a friend, Andrew Wilmore, the novelist. And to tell you the truth, we were speaking of the shock I experienced when I realized that I had been devoting every effort of which I was capable to saving the life of, shall we say, a criminal. Your father heard me say, in rather a flamboyant manner, perhaps that in future I declare war against all crime and all criminals. She smiled very faintly, a smile which had in it no single element of joy or humor. I can quite understand my father intervening, she said. He poses as being a rather patron of artistically perpetrated crime. Sue is his favorite author, and I believe that he has exceedingly grim ideas as to dueling and fighting generally. He was in prison once for six months at New Orleans for killing a man who insulted my mother. Nothing in the world will ever have convinced him that he had not done a perfectly legitimate thing. I am expecting to find him quite an interesting study when I know him better, Francis pronounced. My only fear is that he will count me an unfriendly person and refuse to have anything to do with me. I am not at all sure, she said indifferently, that it would not be very much better for you if he did. I cannot admit that, he answered, smiling. I think that our paths in life are too far apart for either of us to influence the other. You don't share his tastes, do you? Which ones? she asked, after a moment's silence. Well, boxing for one, he replied. They tell me that he is the greatest living patron of the ring, both here and in America. I have never been to a fight in my life, she confessed. I hope that I never may. I can't go as far as that, he declared but boxing isn't altogether one of my hobbies. Can't we leave your father and his tastes alone for the present? 
I would rather talk about ourselves. Tell me what you care about most in life. Nothing, she answered listlessly. But that is only a phase, he persisted. You have had terrible trials, I know, and they must have affected your outlook on life. But you are still young, and while one is young, life is always worth having. I thought so once, she assented. I don't now. But there must be. There will be compensations, he assured her. I know that just now you are suffering from the reaction. After all, you have gone through. The memory of that will pass. The memory of what I have gone through will never pass, she answered. There was a moment's intense silence, a silence pregnant with reminiscent drama. The little room rose up before his memory, the woman's hopeless, hating eyes, the quivering thread of steel, the dead man's mocking words. He seemed at that moment to see into the recesses of her mind. Was it remorse that troubled her, he wondered? Did she lack strength to realize that in that half hour at the inquest he had placed on record forever his judgment of her deed? Even to think of it now was morbid, although he would never have confessed it even to himself. There was growing daily in his mind some idea of reward. She had never thanked him. He hoped that she never would. But he had surely a right to claim some measure of her thoughts, some light place in her life. Please look at me, he begged, a little abruptly. She turned her head in some surprise. Francis was almost handsome in the clear spring sunlight, his face alight with animation, his deep-set gray eyes full of amused yet anxious solicitude. Even as she appreciated these things, and became dimly conscious of his eager interest, her perturbation seemed to grow. Well, she ventured, do I look like a person who knew what he was talking about? he asked. On the whole, I should say that you did, she admitted. Very well, then, he went on cheerfully. Believe me when I say that the shadow which depresses you all the time now will pass. I say this confidently, he added, his voice softening because I hope to be allowed to help. Haven't you guessed that I am very glad indeed to see you again? She came to a sudden standstill. They had just passed through Lansdowne Passage, and were in the quiet end of Curzon Street. But you must not talk to me like that, she expostulated. Why not, he demanded. We have met under strange and untoward circumstances. But are you so different from other women? For a single moment she seemed infinitely more human, startled, a little nervous, exquisitely sympathetic to an amazing and unexpected impression. She seemed to look with glad but terrified eyes toward the vision of possible things, and then to realize that it was but a trick of the fancy and to come shivering back to the world of actualities. I am very different, she said quietly. I have lived my life. What I lack in years has been made up to me in horror. I have no desire now but to get rid of this aftermath of years as smoothly and quickly as possible. I do not wish any man, Mr. Letzman, to talk to me as you are doing. You will not accept my friendship? It is impossible, she replied. May I be allowed to call upon you? He went on doggedly. I do not receive visitors, she answered. They were walking slowly up Corzon Street now. She had given him every opportunity to leave her, opportunities to which he was persistently blind. Her obstinacy had been a shock to him. I am sorry, he said, but I cannot accept my dismissal like this. I shall appeal to your father. However much he may dislike me, he has at least common sense. She looked at him with a touch of the old horror in her coldly questioning eyes. In your way, you have been kind to me, she admitted. Let me in return give you a word of advice. Let me beg you to have nothing whatever to do with my father, in friendship or in enmity. Either might be equally disastrous. Either in the long run, 
is likely to cost you dear. If that is your opinion of your father, why do you live with him? he asked. She had become entirely callous again. Her smile, with its mocking quality, reminded him for a moment of the man whom they were discussing. Because I am a luxury and comfort loving parasite, she answered deliberately, because my father gladly pays my accounts at Lucille and Worth and Reveille, because I have never learnt to do without things. And please remember this, my father, so far as I am concerned, has no faults. He is a generous and courteous companion. Nevertheless, number 7B, Curzon Street, is no place for people who desire to lead normal lives. And with that she was gone. Her gesture of dismissal was so complete and final that he had no courage for further argument. He had lost her almost as soon as he had found her. End of chapter 12《Chapter Thirteen of the Evil Shepherd by E. Phillips Oppenheim. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Four men were discussing the verdict at the adjourned inquest upon Victor Bidlake at Soto's American Bar about a fortnight later. They were Robert Fairfax, a young actor in musical comedy, Peter Jacks, a cinema producer, Gerald Morris a dress designer, and Sidney Voss, a music composer and librettist, all habitués of the place and members of the little circle towards which the dead man had seemed, during the last few weeks of his life, to have become attracted. At a table a short distance away, Francis Ledsman was seated with a cocktail and a dish of almonds before him. He seemed to be studying an evening paper and to be taking but the scantest notice of the conversation at the bar. It just shows, Peter Jacks declared, that crime is the easiest game in the world. Given a reasonable amount of intelligence, a murderer's business is about as simple as a sandwichman's. The police, Gerald Morris, a pale-faced, anemic-looking youth, declared, rely upon two things circumstantial evidence and motive. In the present case, there is no circumstantial evidence. As to motive, poor old Victor was too big a fool to have an enemy in the world. Sidney Voss, who was up for the Sheridan Club and had once been there, glanced respectfully across at Francis. "'You ought to know something about crime and criminals, Mr. Ledsman,' he said. "'Have you any theory about the affair?' Francis set down the glass from which he had been drinking, and, folding up the evening paper, laid it by the side of him. "'As a matter of fact,' he calmly answered, "'I have.' The few words, simply spoken, yet in their way, charged with menace, trilled through the little room. Fairfax swung round upon his stool, a tall, aggressive-looking youth, whose good looks were half eaten up with dissipation. His eyes were unnaturally bright. The cloudy remains in his glass indicated absinthe. "'Listen, you fellows,' he exclaimed. "'Mr. Francis Ledsman, the great criminal barrister, is going to solve the mystery of poor old Victor's death for us.' The three other young men all turned around from the bar. Their eyes and whole attention seemed riveted upon Francis. No one seemed to notice the newcomer, who passed quietly to a chair in the background, although he was a person of some note and interest to all of them. Imperturbable and immaculate as ever, Sir Timothy Brast smiled amiably upon the little gathering, summoned a waiter, and ordered a dry martini. "'I can scarcely promise to do that,' Francis said slowly, his eyes resting for a second or two upon each of the four faces. Exact solutions are a little out of my line. I think I can promise to give you a shock, though, if you're strong enough to stand it. There was another of those curiously charged silences. The bartender paused with the cocktail shaker still in his hand. Voss began to beat nervously upon the counter with his knuckles. We can stand anything but suspense, he declared. Get on 
with your shock giving. I believe that the person responsible for the death of Victor Bidlake is in this room at the present moment, Francis declared. Again the silence, curious, tense, and dramatic. Little Jimmy, the bartender, who had leaned forward to listen, stood with his mouth slightly open, and the cocktail shaker which was in his hand leaked drops upon the counter. The first conscious impulse of everybody seemed to be to glance suspiciously around the room. The four young men at the bar, Jimmy and one waiter, Francis and Sir Timothy Brast, were its only occupants. I say, you know, that's a bit thick, isn't it? Sidney Voss stammered at last. I wasn't in the place at all. I was in Manchester, but it's a bit rough on these other chaps. Victor's pals. I was dining at the Café Royale, Jax declared loudly. Morris drew a little breath. Everyone knows that I was at Brighton, he muttered. I went home directly the bar closed, Jimmy said, in a still, dazed tone. I heard nothing about it till the next morning. Alibis by the bushel, Fairfax laughed harshly. As for me, I was doing my show. Everyone knows that. I was never in the place at all. The murder was not committed in the place, Francis commented calmly. Fairfax slid off his stool. A spot of color blazed in his pale cheeks. The glass which he was holding snapped in his fingers. He seemed suddenly possessed. "'I say, what the hell are you getting at?' he cried. "'Are you accusing me or any of us Victor's pals?' "'I accuse no one,' Francis replied, unperturbed. "'You invited a statement from me, and I made it.' Sir Timothy Brast rose from his place and made his way to the end of the counter, next to Fairfax and nearest Francis. He addressed the former. There was an inscrutable smile upon his lips. His manner was reassuring. "'Young gentlemen,' he begged, "'pray do not disturb yourself. I will answer for it that neither you nor any of your friends are the objects of Mr. Ledsman's suspicion. Without a doubt, it is I to whom his somewhat bold statement refers. They all stared at him, immersed in another crisis, bereft of speech. He tapped a cigarette upon the counter and lit it. Fairfax, whose glass had just been refilled by the bartender, was still ghastly pale, shaking with nervousness and breathing hoarsely. Francis, tense and alert in his chair, watched the speaker, but said nothing. You see, Sir Timothy continued, addressing himself to the four young men at the bar, I happen to have two special aversions in life. One is sweet champagne, and the other amateur detectives, their stories, their methods, and everything about them. I chanced to sit upstairs in the restaurant within hearing of Mr. Ledsman and his friend Mr. Wilmore, the novelist, the other night, and I heard Mr. Ledsman, very much to my chagrin, announce his intention of abandoning a career in which he has, if he will allow me to say so, with a courteous bow to Francis, attained considerable distinction, to indulge in the moth-eaten, flamboyant, and melodramatic antics of the lesser Sherlock Holmes. I fear that I could not resist the opportunity of, I think you young man call it, pulling his leg. Everyone was listening intently, including Shopland, who had just drifted into the room and subsided into a chair near Francis. I moved my place, therefore, Sir Timothy continued, and I whispered in Mr. Ledsman's ear some rhodomontade to the effect that if he were planning to be the giant criminal detector of the world, I was by ambition the arch-criminal, or words to that effect. And to give emphasis to my words, I wound up by prophesying a crime in the immediate vicinity of the place within a few hours. A somewhat significant prophecy under the circumstances, Francis remarked, reaching out for a dish of salted almonds and drawing them towards him. Sir Timothy shrugged his shoulders deprecatingly. I will confess, he admitted, 
that I had not in my mind an affair of such dimensions. My harmless remark, however, has produced cataclysmic effects. The conversation to which I refer took place on the night of young Bidlake's murder, and Mr. Ledsman, with my somewhat, I confess, bombastic words in his memory, has pitched upon me as the bloodthirsty murderer. Hold on a moment, sir, Peter Jacks begged, wiping the perspiration from his forehead. We've got to have another drink, quick. Poor old Bobby here looks knocked all up a heap, and I'm kind of jumpy myself. You'll join us, sir? I thank you, was the courteous reply. I do not, as a rule, indulge to the extent of more than one cocktail, but I will recognize the present as an exceptional occasion. To continue, then, he went on, after the glasses had been filled, I have, during the last few weeks, experienced the ceaseless and lynx-eyed watch of Mr. Ledsman and, presumably, his myrmidons. I do not know whether you are all acquainted with my name, but in case you are not, let me introduce myself. I am Sir Timothy Brass, chairman, as I dare say you know, of the United Transvaal Gold Mines, chairman also of two of the principal hospitals in London, vice president of the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, a patron of sports in many forms, a traveler in many countries, and a recipient of the honor of knighthood from His Majesty in recognition of my services to various philanthropic works. These facts, however, have availed me nothing now that the bungling amateur investigator into crime has pointed the finger of suspicion towards me. My servants and neighbors have alike been plagued to death with cunning questions as to my life and habits. I have been watched in the streets and watched in my harmless amusements. My simple life has been peered into from every perspective and direction. In short, I am suspect. Mr. Ledsman's terrifying statement a few minutes ago was directed towards me and me only. There were murmurs of sympathy from the four young men, who each in his own fashion appeared to derive consolation from Sir Timothy's frank and somewhat caustic statement. Francis, who had listened unmoved to this flow of words, glanced towards the door behind which dark figures seemed to be looming. "'That is all you have to say, Sir Timothy?' he asked politely. "'For the present, yes,' was the guarded reply. "'I trust that I have succeeded in setting these young gentlemen's minds at ease.' "'There is one of them,' Francis said gravely, "'whose mind not even your soothing words could lighten. Shoplin had risen unobtrusively to his feet. He laid his hand suddenly on Fairfax's shoulder and whispered in his ear. Fairfax, after his first start, seemed cool enough. He stretched out his hands toward the glass, which as yet he had not touched, covered it with his fingers for a moment, and drained its contents. The gently sarcastic smile left Sir Timothy's lips. His eyebrows met in a quick frown. His eyes glittered. What is the meaning of this? he demanded sharply. A policeman in plain clothes had advanced from the door. The manager hovered in the background. Shoplin saw that all was well. It means, he announced, that I have just arrested Mr. Robert Fairfax here on a charge of willful murder. There is a way out through the kitchens, I believe. Take his other arm, Holmes. And now, gentlemen, if you please. There were a few bewildered exclamations, then a dramatic hush. Fairfax had fallen forward on his stool. He seemed to have relapsed into a comatose state. Every scrap of color was drained from his sallow cheeks. His eyes were covered with a film, and he was breathing heavily. The detective snatched up the glass from which the young man had been drinking and smelt it. "'I saw him drop a tablet in it just now,' Jimmy faltered. "'I thought it was one of the digestion pills he used sometimes.' Shoplin and the policeman placed their hands underneath the armpits of the unconscious man. "'He's done, sir,' the former whispered to Francis. 
We'll try and get him to the station if we can. End of chapter 13